there are. Okay. Get your praise on. Father, we just thank you today for, again, being able to come to you, to worship you, to praise you. Even though we're small, Lord, but we just ask that you would send others in to build this congregation, that your Holy Spirit would touch hearts of people out there in the Amen. streets that are wandering, looking, seeking somewhere to go. I've talked to people that are looking for other churches, but Lord, we need lost souls to come, as well as those that are looking for other churches, those that have a desire and a hunger for your word and to learn of you and, and how to grow in you and become more like you and to live each day to give you praise and glory and honor for what you are doing in their lives. I ask today, Lord, that you open every heart that's here, open those that are out there on the internet, their hearts also to be able to hear, to understand, and to receive your word into their hearts, that their lives will never be the same, Hallelujah. that they'll always be changing from glory to glory, because you have become a part of us. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for what you're about to do, yes, and we Lord. just ask that you have your way in our midst right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Judgment, phase six. And we're going to be talking about crowns and what they mean and who's going to get what and who's not going to get what. It's interesting when you go through the scriptures and you begin to read and, and to study God's word, but let's open it up and look at uh, a crown. It's a special headdress worn uh, by royalty and other persons in high merit and honor. The crown probably involved from the cloth headband of, or a turban by a tribal leader. And when you, some years ago, the archaeologists discovered in Jericho tomb a copper headband or crown dating from about 2000 BC. Both the king and the high priest of Israel wore crowns. But we have been told more about the latter than the former. If you read in Exodus 28 and Leviticus 8, I'm not reading those, but you, if you're taking notes, you can take that down and look at them. David's golden crown was a prize of battle in 2 Samuel chapter 12. As a symbol of his authority, the crown was worn when the king was on his throne and when uh, leading his forces to combat. The crown, word crown was also used figuratively referring to the old man's gray head. Now don't you get your eyes up, so up here on mine because <laughs> there are many of us that have it. I started getting mine when I was 24. That's been a long time ago. But at any rate, you'll find all of this in the Bible, in the Old Testament, as well as in you. While most references to the crown of the Old Testament, to the actual headdress in the New Testament, it usually has a figurative of significance. Paul's envisioned a crown of righteousness for himself and for others. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 8. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them that love his appearing. And James also speaks about the crown of life. One Chapter 1, verse 12. says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. While the winning runner of that day, as Paul mentioned uh, in, in uh, Corinthians, they received a crown of garland of mirth leaves. Paul for, uh, forward to uh, look forward to the crown that he would receive because it would not be a crown that would decay. That's something we 
are to look forward to because the crown that God gives is not going to decay. And there are five different crowns. We'll, we'll be looking at them this morning. And we'll be talking about some of them. And so as we look here, uh, you see the, the athlete that was very victorious, his reward, of course, he had to obey all the rules. I brought that out in the last sermon that I preached to you. That if he did not obey those rules down to the letter, he would be disqualified. He would not receive a crown. Think about the rules that God has laid down for us that we have to follow. If we fail to follow his laws and his commandments, his teachings, his word, we won't receive the blessings that we should. Because what did he tell us when he, before he, uh, after he went to the cross and after he was raised from the dead, he spoke to his disciples as well as to us. We are to go where? In all the world and preach the gospel. That means each and every one of us. None of us are excluded from it. We are to share what the Lord has done. You know, a lot of people over the years I have run across, a lot of people say, I don't have anything to say. I don't know what to say. Well, you only have one thing to say, and that's your testimony. That's the most powerful thing that you have that you can share with others. Don't. It's all right if you want to share somebody else's testimony, but it's not yours. It's what God did for you, how he saved you, how he delivered you, how he gave you a brand new heart. He took out the old heart. And it's when you begin to deliver your testimony, that's what's going to count. That's what people are looking for because they're looking at you and me every day, seeing how we are living. You may not know this, but I don't care where you go, people are looking at you. They're watching your actions. They're watching your words. They're watching how you respond to different ones. Someone that may offend you. They're watching. So we are to be what? A living example of Jesus Christ. Because he died for our sins. He rose again on the third day. Now, when we look at these crowns, and, and we see how the uh, in Second Timothy two five, as we talked about the athlete, he did not receive the reward unless he obeyed the rules. Conversely, the word evokes revulsion when we read of Roman soldiers weaving the briars into a crown of Jesus' head. In the book of Revelation, crowns are both realistic and fugitive. The 24 elders seated around God's throne were wearing gold crowns and they worship and they cast their crowns before the throne. Opposing all the, uh, later on a seven-headed dragon appeared wearing a crown on each head, but opposing all evil forces was the son of man wearing a golden crown. In each case, the crown symbolizes power, either good or evil. What are they and how are they described in Scripture? We're going to be looking at some of those. They are described in terms of generalities. What we know about rewards is given in terms that are more general than specific. The promise of crowns. This seems to be used as a symbol of victory of authority and responsibility. The promise of the uh, heavenly treasure stresses their eternal value and security. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, To an inherited, uh, inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, bear in mind, God has a reward for you. And then we look and see also the promise of accolades or commendation. This is seen 
that those uh, passages where a reward is administered to the form of something like a well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, this is something a lot of us we talk about, and well, I hope when I get to heaven, God's going to say, well done, that good and faithful servant. Let's look at what it tells us there in Matthew 25, 21, when Jesus said, he said, uh, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. And notice what he's saying there. He didn't say many things, but he said a few things. Thou has been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. And then in Luke 19, 17, he says, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little. Again, bringing up few things, not a whole lot of things. Then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, he tells us this because this is where a lot of Christians get into trouble from time to time. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the heart, and they sh that then shall every man have praise of God. Because God has, did, has done what? He has promised you blessings to all of us that overcome. Amen. 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 So, and you know, we look at this, and this could uh, refer to special blessings or rewards of those believers who overcome special trials. And and the thing we have to remember is, look at Revelations two seven. Jesus says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To 11 of Revelation, he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. You see, a lot of folks don't realize there's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. And God can destroy the spiritual body. Jesus told, he says, fear not what man can do to the body, but fear him who can destroy both in hell, fire. So the spiritual and the physical man Physical man gonna die once, but the spiritual man can die twice if he's not in the Lord. You stop and think about it. Because the Bible tells us we're going to give an account for him. We're going to stand before him. Now, I talked about it the last time I was with you. The Bema seat. The seat of Jesus. The Bema means a raised platform. Jesus was what? He was raised up, wasn't he? Remember before he, when he went to the cross, he said, but if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And then when he went to the grave, he was what? He was lifted out of the grave. He came forth. The grave couldn't contain him. Couldn't hold him. But he came out of that grave. Because... All of power and all authority was given unto him. Paul tells us there in uh, Luke 19, 26, he says, For I say unto you that unto every one which hath, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Now let me say something here for a moment. There are, some are going to receive blessings. We've talked about that in the past. Some will not, but him, but he that hath, he says it's going to be taken away from him. What's he going to do? Or he's going to give it to somebody else that did something else, uh, did more, I should say, and him that didn't do anything, but kind of stand there, expecting it all to come to him. But you see, our rewards may be likened to our spiritual gifts. 
Our rewards seem to primarily be a matter of responsibility and maybe opportunities, but they will not be like badges of metal we wear in, as in the military. Remember that all of our crowns will be cast where? At the feet of Jesus Christ. For he is worthy to receive it. And you see, when we look in Revelation, we look in Matthew, we look in, in Luke, that shows us our rewards consist of authority either over either many things or many cities. You ever thought about you might be ruling over cities, people? Lord, I don't know what I what I had to do that. But he's going to give you the authority and the power to do that. And it may be that you may be included in the uh, ruling of the galaxies in the universe. Now, you've heard me say, if you've been here any time, I believe one day when, when it all comes to a close and we're all in heaven, I believe that we'll be able to go anywhere in God's creation as we think it. Sure. I agree. I believe now I want I want to say this. There's a lot of places in the United States of America I would love to see. I've never been and probably never will get to see. Not here in this time. But I believe that when because you know he said he's going to create what? A brand new heaven and a brand new earth. It's going to be the perfect place. And it's going to be the most beautiful thing you, we've ever laid eyes on. Now we have a lot of beauty around us, amen. But I believe we'll be able to think a thought and be there as quick as we thought it. That amazes me. Because, see, I'm basing this on Scripture because what, uh, who was it? Philip had just baptized a eunuch. And what happened to him? He was translated from where he was many, many miles away. Hallelujah. Man, you don't need an airplane. You don't need an automobile. You don't need a horse. You don't need anything but Jesus. And you can be, be there. I'll share this with you since I'm talking about that. Some years ago, I was kind of caught up in the spirit. And I was, I could see this person as if I was there in person. He was uh, a Chinaman over in China. I've never been to China. But I saw him as plain as I can see you seated here in this congregation today. And I was interceding for him. I didn't know what for, but God had moved on my heart to pray for him. And I was like I was just flying over top of him. And, and I began to pray for him, not knowing what God wanted me to pray, but I was praying in the spirit, but I saw him as plain as you and me. Wow. And it won't the first time, it won't the last time. I've had other visions like that. But I'm not here to boast about what, what I've seen and how it happened, but I'm here to encourage you as believers in Jesus Christ that you can have those same things because of the uh, manifestation of God's spirit. He can manifest any of these things. You said the old men will do what? Dream, Dream dreams. dreams, and the young will see visions. Well, we old folks can see, have a lot of good dreams, amen? And, and the young ones can have visions. Praise God. But it's all for the glory of God. It's not for us, but for him. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that live, liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are were created and were created. In Scripture, the church is viewed as the heavenly kingdom, a universal priesthood. This may indicate something of our authority. We may rule over these galaxies, celestial bodies, the heavens, definitely over angels, the Bible tells us. But let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 
2 and 3, Paul says, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye worthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Israel is the earthly kingdom and will undoubtedly have authority over portions and sections of the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom. As, in, uh, as we can look through Matthew, if you ever sit down and get time to sit down and read Matthew 25, the whole thing, and Daniel, you can read him, uh, chapter 7, and you'll get, a, get an insight into these. I'm not going into all of them because there's so many scriptures there, but they are excellent for research. Crowns of the New Testament, the word used for crowns is in the Greek is Stephanos. I, have you got your Stephanos today? Well, of course, this is was the victor's crown, the wreath given to the victorious athlete before the judge at the Bema. It is a word used of the crowns for a promise to believers for faithfulness in the Christian life. In Revelation 19:12. But we see something else here, diadem. This was the was the royal crown, the crown of king. It's used seven uh, of seven diadems of the beast in Revelation. But to stress that Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, this word is also used of the many diadems the Lord will wear at His return. Think about it, the crowns that He will wear. Revelation 19, 12 says, His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. You see, the principle, the Lord Jesus is the victor, and our victory is really his victory, which is appropriated by faith. Crowns are given as rewards for the faithfulness to the appropriate Appropriate God's grace and God's victory in the Christian life. They remind us of our responsibility to abide in the vine. When Jesus comes, each believer will receive his or her just reward. Now, I want to bring out something. I may bring it out a little later, too. Now, if you've been to funerals, you hear a lot of the preachers get up and say, well, this individual has gone to his rewards no he has not you do not receive any rewards here now or when you die because when you follow scripture you're going to find out when jesus comes back he's what he's going to bring his rewards with him to do what to give to you now don't you get it confused that well when I die I'm gonna get my rewards. So, uh, the only reward you're going to get is when you get to heaven. But the blessing that you're going to get is going to be the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be what present with the Lord. So the spirit leaves the body and it goes to be with Jesus. That's a blessing. Hallelujah. Your reward hasn't been given yet. So hang in there. Amen. It's coming. Because soon and very soon we're going to meet the king. Hallelujah. Amen. And when we do, he's going to bring it with him. So as we look at these things, no rewards will be given by political preferment, but only in the exact proportion of the genuine effort put forth other uh, parables of the Lord, which should be studied in connection with the Christian service of the unprofitable servant. Y'all can look that up in Luke 17. And the labor of the vineyard, Matthew 10. And the talents in Matthew 25. Very interesting when you get to searching these scriptures and, and you read them and you find out who gets the blessing and who gets the rewards. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40 and 42 which we had in our part of our responsive reading this morning. Paul says, There are also celestial bodies, body terrestrials, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 
There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Every Christian will be given a celestial body in the resurrection. But these bodies will differ in the glory that each uh, shall possess and enjoy in heaven. Paul asked us to notice how the stars differ in glory. Some shining with great brilliance than others. Then he includes, so also is the res resurrection of the dead. All believers will have glorified bodies. But there will be differences in glory according to the measure of our diligence and devotedness to Christ and his word. Crowns or rewards. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crowns. Or take thy crown. Hold fast what you have. Don't lose it. I mean, no, and remember, you can lose. You can lose it if you. You will lose it if you don't use it. Yep. Amen. Amen. So you got to use what you got, what the Lord has given you. Put it into practice. And then in Revelation twenty-two twelve, He says, "And behold, I come quickly." And my look at what I just told, told you. My reward is what is with me. To give to every man according to his work. Right there it is. Your reward will be given to you when Jesus comes back. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're mighty quiet on me this morning. <laughs> the incorruptible crown. Paul tells us in 925 of 1 Corinthians. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to attain a corruptible crown, but we do what? We an incorruptible crown. Here Paul has in mind the athlete in the Roman arena. Before the contest, the participant practiced self-discipline, being temperate in all things. There are were doubtless many pleasures and pastimes that the athlete might have entered into and enjoyed. But they denied themselves these things in order to do their best. Think about Christians today. How many are not denying themselves to do better? But they love pleasure more than they love God. Yeah. We, all we have to do is step out our doors <laughs> and we can see the pleasure everywhere. That people love more than they love God. But, you know, Brother Alvin talked about this morning being on the river. I used to go down there years ago, just me and Jesus. The water rippling over the rocks, the fish swimming all around, the birds singing. Talk about having a good time. You can get close to God there because you rule out everything else is around you except what's there for in, to be enjoyed that God created. Go to the mountains. How many have ever been on a mountain and had a mountaintop experience? I've been there. I had an experience with God on the side of a mountain. I didn't have to go there, but it was there. I felt that I needed to get alone with God. Well, if, if anybody had been around, they thought a tribe of Indians might have moved in. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just me and Jesus. I was pouring my heart out to him. I needed to know what he wanted me to do, where he wanted me to go. A friend of mine invited me to Ohio to come join him in his church up there. Well, I went up there. 
but God spoke to me through a young young lady. I think she was about 17, 18 years old through the word of knowledge. And she said, God said, you don't belong here. I knew that, but I had to hear it from somebody else. And so when she spoke those words, she also said, God said that, Many man has tried to open doors for you. But he said, I'm going to kick those doors in and you're going to walk in. And I did. I came back to Virginia after I told the guy, God doesn't want me here. And I came back here and that's when I went into the prison ministry. He opened up the federal prison city of Petersburg Jail, Dinwiddie County Jail, State Facility, and the facility out in Prince George. I mean, he just opened the doors and I walked in. Amen. And for 27 years, I delivered the word to most of those facilities. Talked to a lot of guys. But you see, when God's in control, when he opens a door, it opens. Nobody shuts it. Amen. And you walk in and you do what he called you to do. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. I had no idea where I was going or what I was going to be doing. But I found out you talk about trusting the Lord and that he provides for everything you have need of. Amen. He takes care of you. So don't get caught up in Letting it go to you. A lot of people, they, they get into some ministry, they, they head swell so big, they can't see and hear what God is saying. They miss the mark. And what did Paul say? He said he strived for the mark of the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Amen. You reach out and let God lead you. You know, the Bible, as we look at it, there are certain pleasures, worldly amusements, manners of dress, uses of cosmetics that interfere with one's progress in spreading the gospel and winning the loss of Christ. If I live victoriously over all things, making no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, I shall gain the reward for a victorious life, which is the incorruptible crown. If an athlete must subject himself to many months of rigid discipline and training to attain a uh, corruptible crown, how much more should we bring our bodies into subjection for the crown that is incorruptible? Amen. To think about it now, we all go through it from time to time. We, we work, but our works don't get us into heaven. Because I always said this, and I, and I continue to say this, that if you and I, those of us that have come to Jesus Christ, once we have come to Christ, you automatically want to serve him. Amen? Amen. You don't have to be told to go serve. You start right where you are. What did Jesus tell the disciples? He said, He's, he didn't tell him to go all over the world. He said, begin where? At Jerusalem, at home. And when you begin at home, then you go out to Judea, and then you go out to other parts of the world. Start at home. Some folks think they got to start all over somewhere else. A young man and his family, I've said, shared this before, and we'll do it again. Some prophet prophesied over him that he was to go out to Tennessee to start a new church. And he went out there with his family, his wife and children. After a few months, he lost everything he had. His home, he had no job. And he finally found a pastor out there that truly knew the word of God. And he, and the pastor 
talked to him and he asked him one thing. He said, did God tell you to come out here? He said, no, God didn't tell me. He said, a man told me. And I thought that man was speaking for God. The pastor told him, he says, if God didn't tell you, then you don't belong here. Always remember this and don't ever forget it. If God tells you something, he plants it in your heart. And somebody comes up to you and tell you that you're going to go somewhere to start a ministry or you're going to preach somewhere. And God has never spoken to you about preaching or teaching the word. And you go out there and you try to do it. Nothing works. You see, here's how God operates. Every time God deals with one of us, he deals with us first in our hearts. And if a man comes up to you and begins to tell you things that you know that's in your heart, that's of God. Because God is confirming it by his word. And he always will. There will be two to three witnesses. Always remember that. Don't jump and run and go just because some man said it. Now, I'm going to share one more thing, and I'm going to get back to what I was talking about. <laughs> back in the 80s, I had a guy that I met from a Pentecostal campground, called himself an instant prophet. He said, brother, you're going to go to Australia and preach the gospel. Then you're going to come back to the British Isles and preach up there. And then you come back to the state of New Jersey and start a church. Well, I took <laughs> I took his prophecy and I put it on the shelf. And you know what? It's still laying there. <laughs> God never said a word to me about going to Australia or the British Isles or starting a church in New Jersey. He sent me back here. <laughs> See, if it had been God, I'd have been there. But it wasn't God. It was a man who liked to. Of course, I found out later after talking to some of the leaders in that campground that that guy tried to make people believe that he, he was hearing from God 24-7. He was just in the flesh. He was just talking to hear his tongue rattle. <laughs> Amen. How many of you have heard those tongue rattles? <laughs> All right. All right. The crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 says, For it is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing or not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that has come. For ye are, are our glory and joy. This is the soul winner's crown. The first thing that a Christian should pray for and seek to cultivate is the desire and ability and wisdom to win lost souls to Jesus Christ. Paul was confident that when he would stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Thessalonian converts would guarantee a crown for all those who shared in bringing them to Christ. Every time an individual is converted, there is joy in heaven. Listen, you know what? The Bible tells us that when, when the lost sheep the 99 went off, one, stayed together, but that one left the flock. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that there was rejoicing in heaven. Did you know who was rejoicing? Not just the angels, but God himself was rejoicing because that one soul came back. Amen. Think about it. Just one individual, God rejoices over. That's how much God loves people. Amen. One soul. And never go around telling people how many souls you have won into the kingdom because you win nobody. You only point them in God's direction and he does the saving. Amen. Amen. You see, what we may ask the question or what is our hope or reward as Christ's witnesses? The answer is in those who will be in heaven because of our prayers, gifts, preaching, and personal work. 
And then we come to the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Here the character of the reward corresponds to the character of the giver. Both are said to be righteousness. The doctrine of our Lord's return is regarded very highly by God, in spite of the fact that Jesus said he would come again, and there are many people who scoff at the thought of Christ appearing. This and kindred truths have brought suffering, hardship, in some cases death, mm. to those who insisted on preaching and teaching them. But how wonderful to know that God has prepared a special reward for all who, took, who look to that blessed hope. Amen who wait for his son from heaven, who love his appearing. Because one day Jesus is going to split the eastern sky. We're going to see him for the first time. Amen. The Bible tells us in 1 John, we're going to know him as he is, and we will be what like him. Hallelujah. Amen. That day is soon and very soon. Look around you, what's going on in the world that we live in. Time is running out. The clock is approaching the midnight hour. Crown of life. In James 1, 12, we read earlier, but let's look at it again. Blessed is the man that endureth temptations. Did you know that you're blessed? Yes. That when you are tempted, you go out, and I mean temptation is on all sides. You're blessed because you are what? An overcomer. Amen. Hallelujah. The devil has no victory. Amen. He has no power unless we oh. give it to him. But you see, when you're tempted and when you're tried, you shall receive, or James says, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, says, Fear none of those things which thou suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The crown of life is reserved for those who have given all their lives for the sake of the gospel. Not all of our Lord's witnesses have been called to suffer modern. Not all would be willing to pay with their lives to take the message of salvation to the lost. How thoughtful and, and how uh, just how he uh, Heavenly Father was when he prepared a martyr's crown for those who suffered persecution for Christ's sake. Though some of us will not receive the crown of life, we will rejoice with those who refuse to count the cost and died and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 2 and 5, we see the crown of glory. Peter says, He says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being, word, being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Amen. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Amen. There are many who have been called and ordained by God to preach and to teach his word. These are under shepherds. That's what we are. Pastor Joshua and myself are under shepherds. We stand under Jesus Christ's authority and power. Because he is the chief shepherd. Let us give ourselves without orientation to the care of the sheep of his pasture, for the crown of unfading glory awaits us in the day when the chief shepherd shall appear. If there is to be joy and rejoicing for those who receive the crowns, surely there will be disappointments and sorrow for those who do not receive them. God keeps us in, keeps an exact record of the sins and works of his children. The record includes all of our motives, all of our acts, all of our response to our uh, to our rejection of God's call to faithful stewardship and service. 
When an unfaithful Christian hears and sees the true record, think about these things. When he hears and sees the true record of his unfaithfulness, when he is reminded of the large sum of money he left behind instead of giving it a portion of it to someone to help spread the gospel. Oh, when he sees how the cause of Christ has suffered because he, he of his neglect and indifference with Christians who has wronged him or his brother or sister and never repented of his sins and sees that ugly deed dragged out of its hiding place. You can't hide anything from God. Yo, open door. Don't think you can hide it because one day it's coming to light. But how in the world is God going to be able to do it all? All the people that have been saved and all of those that hid things, it's going to happen so quick and so fast. It's not going to take hours. It's not going to take days. It's not going to take months. It's not going to take years. It's going to be in a split second. You for, we can never forget he is God. Amen. And nothing is too big for him. If there are 2,500 billion people at the judgment seat of Christ, it will happen in a split second if you put a time to it. It's not going to be over a long, draw period of time. Something to think about, huh? <laughs> Isn't God good? <laughs> Listen to this. I ran across this in my research. The story was told of a great fire in a city apartment. The tenants had all been led to safety, with the exception of one family on one of the upper floors. The mothers, the mother driven to frenzy by the terror that uh, accompanied by the flaming and smoke-filled room leaped to safety into a fireman's net. But it was discovered that in her befogged and delirious mind, she completely forgot her children who perished in the flames. She was saved as by fire, but she suffered great loss. May God grant that we should strive to labor in the light of that hour when all our works shall be judged by Jesus Christ himself, and we shall be rewarded accordingly. Thank of the believers. All members of the body of Christ who have divided it because of differences in organizations, churches, and families. I have seen Christians who have not been on speaking terms. People who were at one time very close and intimate friends are now separated and bitter feelings exist between them. Each blames the separation on the other and they continue on trying to serve the Lord, but their differences have been have not been adjusted. Now, if our Lord returns before there be a reconciliation of such Christians here on earth, yes. it is necessary that they get right with each other somewhere. For certainly they cannot continue forever in holding hatred and animosity in their hearts. Heaven knows no such actions. Hatred and unforgiveness is sin, yet there is no sin in heaven the necessity of the judgment seat of Christ. The psalmist David said for, in 51.3, For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is forever before me. If you read that chapter, you'll find that David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, but restore unto me the joy of your salvation. David knew what he had done was wrong, but he had to be told by somebody else. And because he had committed adultery. But he had love in his heart for God. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. But still, David failed. He messed up. So don't think you have arrived and you can't mess up because you can, I can. Everybody in this room this morning can mess up. But we know how to get right with Jesus. Amen. 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 Go to him. 
Lord, look in my heart. If I'm harboring anything that's not good and not pleasing to your sight, I ask that you forgive me, cleanse me, purify this body, this mind of mine, my heart. Get it right, Lord, so I can serve you with a whole heart, a clean heart, a pure heart. In John chapter 20, verse 23, the Bible tells us if you forgive, forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. In other words, you never let it go. You're still carrying it around. You've got to let it go. You've got to get rid of it. Forgiveness is contrary to the pattern of the world. In this day of constant law, lawsuits of incense, uh, incense demands for legal rights, Paul commands, sounds almost impossible. When someone hurts you deeply, instead of giving him what he deserves, Paul says to do to befriend him, become a friend to him. Yeah. Why does Paul tell us to forgive our enemies? Forgiveness may break a cycle of retaliation and lead to mutual reconciliation. It may make the enemy feel ashamed and change his or her ways. The Bible says what? Heat coals of fire upon the head by doing good, praying for your enemies. Even if your enemies never repent, Forgiving him or her will free you of a heavy load of bitterness. I mean, you know that that bitterness and hatred and resentment destroys a person totally. Forgiveness is an act of the will. Forgiveness involves both attitude and actions. If you find it difficult to feel forgiven of those who have hurt you, try responding with, with kind actions. Sometimes that's hard to do. Yeah. But you've got to take that step of faith Amen. and believe the Lord to take care of it. But you're doing it on your part. He's going to do it on his. He'll take care of it. If appropriated, tell such per people that you would like to heal your relationship. Give them a helping hand. Send them a gift. Smile at them. You try that. <laughs> Go to town today. Boy, I tell you, look around at the folks that you're looking at, and they got such frowns on their faces, but perk up a smile, and next thing you know, you got a smile coming back. Amen? Amen. I do that a lot. I look at somebody, they look so sad, and I just smile, and they smile back. I say, have a good day. That's what God wants us to do. We are the light of the world. We're going to let our light so shine among all of that trash that's around us out there. But forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, If you forgive people their wrongdoings, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive Woo! you of yours. So that's a very important principle. And thing is to remember that we need to learn to forgive one another. Why? Because it keeps the slate clean. If you keep it clean, then God can work in your life. He can do wonders. He can do miracles. See, the judgment seat of Christ is necessary because not one believer has received his reward for any service he has rendered in this life. Often and frequently at funerals, I spoke about that earlier. The, the, they talk about the uh, departed has gone on to his reward or her reward. They have not gone on to any reward. They've just gone to be in the presence of the Lord or they're still down under. They haven't gone up. Because Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And in Hebrews 6, 10, <clears throat> I'm bringing this to a close here. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name. And ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And then in Colossians uh, 3, 23 and 24, he says, And whatsoever you do, 
Look at what he's saying. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell people, Brother Allen can attest to this, and I'm sure all, just about everybody in here, that when I went, went on a job to do a job, I did that job to the best of my ability, but I did it to please Jesus. And when you please Jesus, you're going to find what? You please man. Because that's such a reward. I, I Sometimes I, I had received, when I had, I did not, I mean, I, I checked, charged a fair market price. But after I did the work and completed, I would get rewarded from my customers anywhere from 200 to 500 to 700 dollars extra that I didn't even charge for. That was God. Amen. He provided. He gave. And for all the 33 years that I was in business, he has provided. Absolutely. And, he, and I'm sure you have received such things as that. But it's, that's who your provider is. He will bless you. Even though you So well, I didn't work for that. I don't want that. Look, I want you to have it. Yes, ma'am. Or yes, sir. Thank you. Praise you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because he provided. And I didn't just have that happen to me one time. I had it happen to me many, many times over those 33 years. Because God is my provider. In James 1.12, we started out with this. Blessed is the man that endured temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Amen. In summary of this verse, a crown is something awarded to a victor. While the crown of life might, in fact, be literal, it is certainly respond, uh, representative of the promise of eternal life. The race itself represents our life and its many struggles. Our principal enemy we race against is Satan. And on our own, we cannot win against him. We are assured of victory, however, if we rely on Jesus with true and enduring faith, some promises are conditional and some are not. Either way, once God declares he will do a, a thing, it will be done. You can always count on him. And any time God places a condition on a promise, he offers us responsibility. If we respond to using that responsibility to place our faith in him, we will surely receive the promise. And Jesus, what does the Bible call us in Hebrew? He is a God that he cannot lie. And what's what he has promised he will do. We're going to close it with that hymn, Victory in Jesus. Five hundred and eleven. Oh, bless his name. I heard an old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of the precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He 
Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing word, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. There we go. Full oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. With his redeeming love, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing blood. Father, we thank you today for your word and your people. Yes. I ask that you seal it in their hearts, Lord, that leave this place rejoicing in you. Yes. Give them strength and courage for each and every day, whatever they may encounter, that you put a hedge of protection about them to watch over them. And Lord, give them the word to speak yes. with power and authority to those that will receive it with gladness of heart. And I thank you for them and I ask your blessings to be upon them in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say it. Amen. 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 God bless you and have a blessed week in the Lord. Amen.